people go missing around here, they're gone for good. Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome to Watch Mojo. Today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 horror movie cliches. <laughs> Looks like we've got a serial killer on our hands. Well, serial killer's not really accurate. You gotta knock off a couple more to get that title. World's worst place to get a flat, huh? Uh, this isn't right, we should split up. Maybe we can cover more ground that way. For this list, we're looking at the most widespread horror movie tropes that characters never seem to learn from. What's your favorite or least favorite horror movie cliche? Be sure to let us know in the comments. All right, let's get to it. Number 20, explaining away the cell phone. Old slasher movies had it easy because characters weren't walking around with phones and lines to the outside world in their pockets. Rob? Hey, Rob? No. Rob? My battery's dead. Modern screenwriters have it a bit tougher, and stories are finding a variety of ways to hand wave away the cell phone problem. Have you tried maybe calling 911, see if somebody else can get yeah, there? Yeah, I tried. Okay, well, I mean, what about police? Fire department? I couldn't get through. I okay, tried. Okay, it just seems a little... <laughs> Most of it boils down to a character waving their arms in the air and saying, damn, no signal out here. That won't work. No signal here. It's pretty lazy, but whatever. Others do the dreaded low battery trope, typically accompanied by a horribly timed phone call being cut off by the dying phone. You want some high wire shut situation? Leave, motherfucker. No. You gonna be a, hello? Chris, oh, oh shit. Just once we'd like to see a character bring a portable charger or something. Number 19, mirror scare. If there's a prominent mirror in a horror movie, you better believe that mirror is being used. There are so many variations to the mirror scare, it's not even funny. Ben! Maybe a character looks into the mirror and sees a warped version of themselves on the other side, typically smiling in some malicious fashion. Sometimes they pass by one and some spooky monster or person can be seen in the reflection. Maybe someone looks in their car's rear view mirror and sees someone in the back seat. The worst is when a bathroom mirror cabinet is slightly ajar. You just know that someone's gonna be standing there when the character closes it. You're not real. Number 18, no guns. In the first episode of Stranger Things, a terrified Will immediately runs to the shed and loads up a rifle to defend himself from the monster. <laughs> Scenes like this are unbelievably rare in movies. Many people own guns, whether for hunting, hobby reasons, or personal protection. So why are guns so rare in horror movies? Meryl, swing away. The easy answer is that it would give the characters and story an easy out. Michael wouldn't be so unstoppable with a shotgun on hand. Instead, characters resort to baseball bats, knives, and even a clothes hanger in the case of Laurie Strode. Props to her, though, as it actually worked. For a while, anyway. Oh, the Batman soundtrack. <sighs> Number 17, Paranormal Expert. In every single movie involving ghosts, poltergeists, or the supernatural, there's always some type of expert. A terrible presence is in there with her. So much rage, so much betrayal. I've never sensed anything like it. Some social outsider knows a lot of handy information about the occult and can communicate with ghosts or something. It's not the house that's haunted. It's your son. The family calls in a ghost hunter or a professional demonologist, because those are easily found. Give them strength of mind and body! Oh, Lord! I beg thee! Most often, they go to the local church and a priest performs an exorcism. In any case, the affected are rarely left to their own devices. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, points to the exorcist for handling this in a relatively realistic fashion and acknowledging that exorcism is a long, outdated practice. Most movies are not so smart. Number 16, clumsy running and slow walking. For some bizarre reason, slasher movies keep going back to the same tropey well. The 
the slasher walks at an eerie, if unrealistic, pace, and the victim always trips or gets their foot caught in something while running. <laughs> The whole tripping trope has long gotten stale. And yes, people do trip and get their feet caught in things in real life, but seeing it in every single horror movie and being able to predict roughly when it will happen gets old really fast. It's mostly used as a means to get the villain closer to their victim, because their unnecessarily cumbersome movements would leave them eating dust otherwise. Number 15. Is he really dead? This person just slaughtered your entire group of friends in exceedingly grotesque and horrific ways and has every intention of doing the same to you. Should you really linger around while they're knocked out? It has happened in numerous movies. The victim finally gets the upper hand and actually downs the villain. They're either knocked out or vulnerable. <laughs> Yet, they decide to linger, typically doing the whole, is he really dead thing, and or trying to unmask their attempted murderer. And then the killer wakes up and they get attacked. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life. Props to the first Scream for subverting this trope. And then Scream 2 went and did it. I want to know who it is. Oh no, come on, see, come on, please, let's just go. Number 14, over explaining the unexplainable. Sometimes, a movie devoted to the supernatural goes out of its way to over-explain everything. And it's very annoying. Sometimes when you get haunted, it's like stepping on gum. You take it with you. Why can't a ghost just be a ghost? Does it need to be residual ectoplasm leaking from another dimensional plane or whatever? Do we really need to know how your ridiculous ghost hunting contraption works? Sometimes old wiring can uh, leak into the atmosphere. It causes hallucinations, changes in energy. Do we need to know the complex history and motivations of the demon or where the alien came from? What's this, uh, do? Oh, and there's an instant drop in temperature. A thermostat triggers the camera to take a picture. This seems like a way for filmmakers to legitimize their outlandish story and have it rooted in bases of science and reality. But it just comes across as try-hard at best and unintentionally ridiculous at worst. We're gonna use these guns. They emit a bolt of concentrated energy which can damage the ectoplasmic cells and destroy the ghost. Again, The Exorcist does this best by not really explaining anything. It's so much scarier that way. The condition isn't quite what it seems. Nobody knows the cause of hyperkinetic behavior in a child. Number 13, off them one by one. It's slasher movie tradition that the victims have to go down one by one. This is obviously done to inflate the movie's runtime and provide paying audiences with consistent excitement. Real serial killers often work in this manner as well, for obvious reasons. But just once we'd like to see a slasher dispose of five different characters all at once in some bloodthirsty rampage. Somebody help me! Please, please somebody help me! That type of stuff is typically reserved for the finale, but by then we're expecting most of the cast to die anyway. The only exception to this rule is characters sleeping and dying together, but even that becomes a trope in and of itself. More on that in a bit. Okay, you big hunk of a man, come and get me! Number 12. False Hope If a character seems to be in the clear long before the movie's climax, they are most certainly not in the clear. This trope isn't seen as often as the others, but it's still around and has popped up in various horror movies throughout the decades. In the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Sally is seemingly saved by the gas station proprietor, only to be kidnapped and taken to Leatherface. I hope you're not too uncomfortable down there. <laughs> in 1408, John Cusack's Mike escapes the room and returns to normal life, only to realize that this is just another sadistic machination of the room. The point is, escape never comes to the main character halfway through the movie. If it does, it is most certainly a trick. Number 11. Inept Authorities It's very rare for horror movie authorities to be good at their jobs. In 
many cases, the police aren't even informed of the movie's events, usually because of the dead cell phone battery, no signal nonsense. Looks like we've got a serial killer on our hands. Well, serial killer's not really accurate. Gotta knock off a couple more to get that title. And even if they are informed, they typically act in a generally inept and helpless manner usually by not taking the protagonist seriously, being incompetent and unprofessional, or being knocked off in 10 seconds. And then, even if they are relatively competent, they usually show up far too late and barge into the site of a massacre. Get Out subverts this wonderfully through the character of Rod. I mean, I told you not to go in that house. Number 10. Generic Ghost Activity Why do movie ghosts always resort to the same bag of tricks? Who's ever down there to lock you in now? Some movies try to spin the old ghost yarn in unique and imaginative ways, but most are unfortunately content with reusing the same scares we've seen thousands of times. Ghosts will always make the old floorboards creak, slowly open or slam doors, make the lights flicker, and if they're particularly powerful, throw household objects around. If they want to be seen, they typically stand a distance away from the character and stare at them, usually from an upstairs window, or scream directly in their face for some reason. Is there a ghost handbook they're all forced to follow or something? Number 9. Hiding in Dumb Places We understand that characters are scared and panicking when confronted with a remorseless boogeyman, but what's with the constant hiding under beds and in closets or lockers? often without a weapon, no less. It is a horrible strategy, and it mostly never ends well. When confronted with stress, the body reacts with the fight-or-flight response. And in this case, characters should listen to their bodies. Start running and do not stop. Run outside and scream bloody murder if you can. The absolute last thing you should be doing is running upstairs and hiding in a small enclosed closet with one exit. Number 8. The Middle of Nowhere There's a reason slasher movies rarely take place in Manhattan or downtown Los Angeles. What'd you say? I think we got enough gas. We got enough to get you there. Getting back. That's your concern. It doesn't make for a scary setting, and there are way too many obstacles for the writer to overcome to have the story make any kind of logical sense. Did you find a signal? No, nothing. 97% nationwide coverage and we find ourselves in that 3%. Which is why slashers often take place in the middle of absolute nowhere. People go missing around here, they're gone for good. At the very least, it's a small town suburb with oblivious neighbors. Bonus points for setting the movie in a decrepit mental asylum or prison that's been abandoned for 50 years. These certainly make for unique settings, but after the 183rd time we saw a movie take place in the woods, desert, or rural countryside, it got a little tired. This is Mr. Garrick's property. You're lucky that old mummy fart didn't come out here and put buck shots in your ass. Number 7. Jump Scares It seems like jump scares will never go away. Now, there are tasteful and intelligent ways to utilize jump scares. But most are just a cheap way to startle the audience rather than scare them. I can still hear that voice. What? Jump scares come in a wide variety, almost always accompanied by paused music and that annoying duh sound effect. Some movies even utilize the old false scare trick which almost always involves a cat. And some even utilize the false scare actual scare trick, which involves a character calming down after seeing the cat, then immediately being attacked by the killer slash monster slash ghost who was there all along. Oh, you want to play psycho killer? Can I be the helpless victim? And this attack inevitably comes in the form of a jump scare. There's really no escaping them. Number 6. Nothing ever works. We don't know if everyone buys cheap crap or what, but nothing ever seems to work in horror movies. Like the aforementioned phones, they either never have a signal or lose battery at very inopportune moments. Ooh. 
Lights constantly flicker and often go out completely, leaving characters stranded in the pitch black. This isn't happening. They use a flashlight, but lo and behold, that doesn't work either, almost always resulting in the character hitting it and saying, come on. No, 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 come on. Doors get jammed and won't open. The car inevitably doesn't start, despite that never being a problem before. If the car starts, they get a flat tire. We could go on and on. World's worst place to get a flat, huh? Number five, no one believes the protagonist. Horror movies are quite outlandish by their very nature, especially ones involving the supernatural. This is why it makes a certain kind of sense that unimportant characters never believe the protagonist in their so called insane ramblings. But all I know is they already got two brothers we know, and it could be a whole bunch of brothers they got already. What's the next move? <laughs> Usually, this comes in the form of authority figures who brush away the protagonist's stories and tell them it's all in your head or something of that nature. Oh, white girl. Oh, they get you every time. <laughs> Sometimes, it even comes in the form of the protagonist's friends and acquaintances, who often see them as a weird kook. See? Everything's okay. If people actually listened, these stories would often be over 10 times faster, and a lot of problems could be mitigated. Number four, let's split up. You know what they say, there's power in numbers. So why do horror movie protagonists continuously insist on splitting up? Guys? This trope is as old as horror itself, and it's been parodied to death. But it makes such great fodder for parody because it's both so prevalent and so very stupid. Uh, this isn't right. We should split up. We can cover more ground that way. Yeah. Yeah, good idea. Even if the characters don't intentionally plan on splitting up, they always do, owing to one character taking a wrong turn, falling down a hole, or any other contrivance meant to separate the characters. Stan! Stanley! And once they've been separated, you just know one of them is gonna die. Number three, slashers never say die. It's always very refreshing when a movie slasher actually dies. More often than not, they're depicted as inhuman, literally unstoppable monsters. This trope is especially bad for franchises like Friday the 13th, Halloween, and A Nightmare on Elm Street, although it certainly is not exclusive to those movies. There's simply no tension in slashers like that. We know the main protagonist will survive, and we know the villain isn't gonna die. This trope is especially annoying when the movie portrayed the killer as being dead, only to reveal right before the credits that they are actually alive. Gotta get that easy sequel money. Number two, creepy kids. Can I see my mommy? No, Samara, not until we understand what's wrong with you. There are three main roles for children in horror movies. Helpless victims the protagonist must protect, ghosts, and kids who are somehow connected to the conspiracy and do creepy things. Hello, Danny. Kid ghosts have been seen in countless movies, from The Shining to The Grudge. <coughs> They're typically accompanied by quiet, whispery voices. And the conspiracy kid has been seen in the likes of The Omen and The Ring. Sometimes the helpless victims even turn into creepy kids, like the zombies in Wreck and Night of the Living Dead, or Reagan in The Exorcist. Chances are, if a child is in the movie, they are going to be used in a creepy capacity. Well, then let's introduce ourselves. I'm Damien Karras. And I'm the devil. Now kindly undo these straps. To be clear, not all cliches are bad all the time. They just have to be used sparingly and creatively. Like, I will never not be scared of The Shining Girls. 
Anyway, we've got a bunch of spooky HMs to get through, and then we will name our top horror movie cliche. Who's there? Has asking who's there ever led to a response? Who's there? I'm calling the police. You should never say who's there. Don't you watch scary movies? It's a death wish. Based on a true story, even if it isn't. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Giving away your position, stepping on a stick, knocking something over, etc. Finish me before I turn. No one ever wants to be a zombie. You've been bitten. It's only a matter of time. No, 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 leave my dad alone. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, don't sleep around. It is a long established trope that sex equals instant death. That's why she always outsmarted the killer in the big chase scene at the end. Only virgins can do that. Don't you know the rules? Sometimes they're killed together, but more often than not, one is killed while the other goes to the bathroom or the kitchen. I'll be right back. Don't get dressed. Either way, sex is a big no-no in horror movies. But that's not all, as the pure virgin always lives, and the almost always blonde chick who sleeps around eats it in the first 30 minutes. The counselors weren't paying any attention. They were making love while that young boy drowned. This has been parodied in numerous movies, and for good reason. Sex equals death, okay? It's a huge cliche, and it almost always turns out the exact same predictable way. Hey, filmmakers, how about some sex positivity, am I right? Anyway, I want to hear from you guys about this. Which horror movies subvert these tropes in the best ways? Be sure to let us know in the comments, or come tell me on Twitter or Instagram at Rebecca Brayton, or on my YouTube channel. See ya.